Now, looking specifically at soybeans and soybean disease losses, our losses each season range from anywhere from 5% to about 18%, depending upon uh, environment involved. Therefore, you can see that disease is a major factor in the production of soybeans in our state. Now, let's begin with the major diseases that we have. In this particular case, we're going to start with early season and move through late season diseases. And first, we will look at the seedling blights. Now, there are several pathogens involved with seedling blights. It could be the pathogen Rhizoctonia solani, it could be a fusarium, it could be a pythium, it could be Phytophthora uh, soji, or it could be a combination of these. That's why looking at the seedling blight uh, complex sometimes is very difficult to determine the individual that might be involved. As far as the symptoms and occurrence are concerned, of course, when we're looking at seed and seedling problems, we're looking at the very beginning of the season. So these symptoms can occur just after planting, include any pre-emergent seed rot problems or post-emergent damping off, in other words, seedling death. If we're dealing with the fungi uh, known as Pythium or Phytophthora species, these are usually problematic in wet soils. Keep that in mind when we deal with our disease management scheme for this particular set of problems. You can also see that there's uh, seed death and um, uh, wet rots involved with Pythium and Phytophthora. Those that are affected by Rhizoctonia usually have a dry reddish brown lesion at the base of the stems and like a drier soil, still moist, but not uh, saturated. This is an example then of a seedling blight in soybeans. In this particular case, we have a plant that is totally collapsed and is dead. Also, we have a slide here of a field image where if you look right in the middle of the slide, there's a row of plants missing, and these are because of the soybean seedling blight complex. Looking at the conditions for development, in general, when you're dealing again with Pythium uh, species, you're looking over a wide range of soil temperatures that this particular pathogen likes. When you're looking at Phytophthora species, it's best in, again, wet soils, as we mentioned before, but like soils that are warm in temperature. The high moisture is important with both of these pathogens. When we're looking at Rhizoctonia solani, we see that it is best in temperatures that are warm, again in moist but not saturated soils, and with fusarium, the development is more in the cool temperatures. As far as our disease management is concerned, always plant uh, varieties that are recommended uh, in the time and the type that are chosen for your particular location. Always plant in well-drained soils. This is especially true to prevent the uh, spread and uh, impact of Pythium and Phytophthora. And use fungicide treated seeds and always use high quality seed. That will give you a good start in order to delay or prevent uh, seedling blight issues. Moving next to something that occurs a little later in the season, a disease called aerial blight. It's caused by the fungus uh, Rhizoctonia solani. It is natural in our soils. It is in all of our soils. It is soil borne. So it's a problem uh, that can be found anywhere in the field. As far as its symptoms and occurrence are concerned, we can see initial symptoms any time during the season, but they're most important when they develop in plants that are in late vegetative or uh, early reproductive growth stages. The symptoms appear as water-soaked blotches on the leaves. Eventually, these will dry, and uh, you'll find these mostly in the lower and middle part of the canopy. The reason for that is that's where most of the moisture is and that's where the, where the Rhizoctonia 
uh, develops greatly before moving and spreading to other parts of the plant or to adjacent plants. If the disease uh, progresses, uh, not only within the canopy, but moving from plant to plant, you might find that there are leaves that one lays upon another, and in between you'll find a white cottony fungal mycelial growth. And this is very, very common. The white mycelium that you're seeing, that cottony growth, is actually the Rhizoctonia solani pathogen. If conditions uh, continue to be favorable, uh, and the foliage becomes uh, brown or blighted, and the pods may have some reddish-brown lesions on them. If the pods are uh, infected to a high degree, they will abort, and of course, yield loss is associated with that. But aerial blight uh, will spread very rapidly uh, within the crop and should be managed as soon as it's detected, especially in the late vegetation uh, vegetative or reproductive growth stages. This is uh, the symptoms of aerial blight. The initial symptom was water soaked in these areas that are tan and brown now and then as it develops it dries out the tissue and we get the blotchiness that you see uh, on the leaflet that is in our slide. Again the growth uh, that is on the edge uh, margins of this particular leaf Part of the white cottony uh, growth that we'll see uh, from leaf to leaf by Rhizoctonia solani. This is actually the fungus itself growing and uh, affecting the tissue. And then, of course, in this particular case, what we're finding is a large area of soybeans that have been destroyed due to the action of Rhizoctonia giving this aerial blight in this particular area. As far as the conditions for development, aerial blight likes warm overcast days and extended uh, periods of uh, high relative humidity and leaf wetness. When we get those particular situations, we need to, um, we need to treat because aerial blight is very, very destructive and will continue as long as these conditions continue. And one of our recommendations then for management of this disease is um, increasing the space between rows. That will give airflow between the rows and help to dry out the tissue uh, in the lower leaves and inside the canopy. Another management tip that we use, always use high quality seed. This is not only an issue for aerial blight, but it is for all uh, the diseases that we'll talk about. High quality seed is the best way to start any crop. Increase the row spacing, as I mentioned before, and fungicides can be used and are very effective against aerial blight. The trick with all fungicide use is to get it on uh, target, making sure it moves within that canopy and protects the leaves inside the canopy and the lower portions of the plant. This is especially important when we have aerial blight affecting uh, the late vegetative and the early reproductive growth stages. From that then, let's move to the number one disease we have in the state of Cercospor blight and uh, purple seed stain. The pathogen involved here is Cercospor cucuchii. Symptoms we'll find with the uh, Cercospor blight uh, are that the fungus can infect even seedlings. So infection can occur obviously early in the plant's development. And this can result in plant death at that particular point or latency where the pathogen will continue to grow but not cause death until much later in the plant's development. The foliar symptoms of this disease usually are not evident until the soybeans are in the mid to late reproductive growth stages. So this is not a disease that we're going to see in vegetative stages or even early reproductive stages. The initial symptoms appear as small chocolate brown lesions on the petioles near the base of the leaflet. And as the disease progresses, the foliar symptoms are expressed as reddish brown to tan discoloration on the upper leaf surfaces and in the upper canopy. 
Leaves will have sort of a leathery appearance to them, crinkled a bit, uh, not only in appearance, but also in the feel, in the touch. But the fungus can sporulate in the older lesions and give us symptoms that resemble ashes on top of the leaf. The advanced stages of uh, cercospor blight and purple seed stain result in uh, premature defoliation of leaves, the uh, discolored pods, and a reduction in seed quality. The seed phase of the disease is evidenced by the purple stained seeds at harvest. These are very important symptoms because even at the elevator, uh, these are recognized very easily and a reduction in uh, price will be uh, evident to the grower. As far as symptoms are concerned, this is the petiole symptom with the discoloration on that particular petiole, uh, no particular uh, lesion shape. It's just a discoloration on it. In this slide, we see the beginning of the crinkling and the um, initial uh, stages of cercospor blight on the leaf. Uh, what we're seeing here is the bronzing, bronzing purple lesion just starting on both of those uh, leaflets that you see right in the center. And then eventually uh, with our purple seed stain, we can find this on the seeds as they develop. And this particular slide shows us the advanced symptoms of the foliage. Uh, prior to defoliation, where the purpling is being replaced by the ashen gray symptom, the twisting and curling is evident, uh, still some of the bronzing is evident, but the leathery appearance and feel to this particular leaf is evident, and the, the following symptom then will be defoliation of the petiole. As far as conditions for development are concerned, uh, seedling infection is uh, usually restricted to those temperatures of 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and extends uh, in periods of leaf wetness that require six, uh, 18 to 16 hours. Uh, the petiole and the leaf symptoms, though, that we see late in the reproductive growth stages of the plant including defoliation, actually are favored by hot, dry conditions. And the pathogen itself may be seed borne and survives implant debris in the soil. The fungus also survives on some weeds, so these are characteristics that we need to remember in order to manage this particular pathogen. With disease management, this is very difficult with this particular disease because there is no disease resistance. And so all of the cultural practices that we can use, that of especially burying the crop residue after the growing season, after harvest, and maintaining good weed management uh, become even more important. With fungicides, um, this is not recommended for the most part because of the inconsistency of efficacy with the fungicides. Uh, many fungicides have been tried through the years, many different types of chemistries involved, families of chemistries, and none seem to be consistent. 